evolution works. If dogs come from wolves, why are there still wolves? This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous as a claim. Parapatric speciation simply refers to the idea that we've got an ancestral population, a group of it splits off, that group in and of itself persists and adapts in its given environment, and the other group also stays around. Just because you're born doesn't mean your grandparent or your parent has to die. Oh, well, that one's just ridiculous. We have transitional species spanning numerous different lineages. I mean, pick any two pairs of ancient versus derived critters. If we look at tetrapods and look at a lobe-finned fish, you can span it all the way. Tiktaalik is like your almost perfect midpoint where we've got the acquisition of all the different characteristics of what kind of defines a tetrapod. Powerful pectoral muscles, lungs, four limbs, the, the, the uh, arms and the forearm and in the upper arm, the classic tetrapod pattern. And of course, we've got the hominins, which is what I specialize in, where we've got over 20 individual hominins that span the acquisition of the traits that differentiate modern humans from an ancient random Miocene ape that would have looked something like a chimp, but probably more like a, a quadrupedal monkey-looking ape. Evolution makes a very simple prediction with transitional species, which is that if we take an ancient critter and a modern critter, we should see morphologic change through geologic time, showing the, as I said previously, acquisition of those characteristics that separate the modern from the ancient. And we find this in any pair of organisms that you want to pick, whether it's hominins or tetrapods or cetaceans or birds. <laughs> Evolutionist, wow, this is um, a term that is sort of coined as almost being derogatory by creationists and sort of evangelicals and the like, but evolutionist defines anybody who accepts speciation, to be quite frank, which these days defines every creationist as well as every biologist. and basically encompasses what, what all people accept to be true about the natural world, which is that populations change over time, and that there is no gap, there is no um, sort of barrier that that change can really um, not, not surpass, not cross. Creationists would disagree with that portion, but they would of course agree that, I'm sure, uh, at least for the most part, that dogs come from wolves. And in the strictest sense, this is speciation, this is evolution, and thus that creationist is an evolutionist. Um, it, it would depend on what you mean. It would depend on like, why are humans on top with regard to the hominins or why are we on top with regard to the mammals? And for that second question, I mean, there are, humans are very prolific on the planet, but there are a great many other animals that are more common than we are. If, if we're defining success, let's, let's put it, let me put it this way. If we're defining success by sheer numbers, then we're beat out by ants which are, are some of the most numerous animals on the planet. They are, in fact, animals. They're hymenopterans, arthropods. If we're defining success by tenure on the planet, how long a species has been around, Homo sapiens loses yet again. In fact, we lose even within our own group of hominins. Homo erectus, sensuleto, so in a broad sense, was around for two million years before it finally went extinct. We've been around for 300,000 years. In fact, if we want to look at some of the, um, some of the estimations for Neanderthals, we lose to Neanderthals, and they're gone, and yet we're still here. Now, if you want to propose that humans are going to persist for another 300,000 years, I have a bridge to sell you, but maybe we'll be lucky. As far as why hominins, like, you know, look at it from the perspective of like, why are we the ones sitting here talking through insanely cool technology? It's a combination of selection and luck. Good luck. Uh, the fact that the primary thing that separates us from the other hominins, from Neanderthals, for example, is we have a, a special gene that has only really been recently identified in a paper in 2002. It's a gene called transketolase-like 1, and it's a single point mutation difference between us and Neanderthals. Neanderthals have, I believe, I can't I can never remember whether we have the arginine or the lysine version, but it's a point mutation, uh, that's it. And the difference is huge because the point mutation has occurred in uh, an area that's responsible for the production of these things called radial glial cells, which are in themselves responsible for, for basically turning stem cells into neurons. So with this mutation, humans, as compared to previous hominins, all the hominins that lived previously, can actually uh, sort of create a greater neuronal density and thus it ups our cognition. So what happens if you've got you know, an ancient past and you have a, a hominin and Neanderthals, or sorry, a human and Neanderthals, Neanderthals and Denisovans all living on a changing landscape. Well, if you have greater neuronal density, your odds of being able to adapt to that change by innovation, simple innovation and within your own environment are going to be greater. So it might have been that this immense change came and humans were just better prepared to change with it as compared to Neanderthals who were really good at what they did 
but their way of life was, was sort of on the way out. So Lucy is a hominin, so it is a, an animal, an ape, that is more closely related to humans than it is to chimpanzees. Lucy is specifically a member of a species called Australopithecus afarensis, lived around 3.9 to 2.9-ish million years ago. And the really cool thing about Lucy is that she's bipedal. So there was a long question in this, in long-standing question in anthropology of like, which came first, which evolved first, bipedality or big brains? And Lucy really set in stone the, the fact that we see bipedality walking around on two legs First, creationists look at Lucy and they say, well, we only have one of them and it's just a knuckle walking chip. And that is like as far from the truth as you could possibly get. Because one, we don't just have one Lucy. In Australopithecus, the genus, we have the remains of like over 400 individuals. Some of these are, are fragmentary, pieces of skulls, pieces of long bones, and some of them are nearly full skeletons, like what we see in the, in the little foot fossil of Australopithecus africanus or the Dakika child. These are, these are very well represented animals. Australopithecus sediba, it was even preserved with some of the bones still in articulation, still touching in the rock when, when the organism was preserved. And so by looking at that, we can tell that these things, first of all, there were a great many of them, so we have a great idea, a great representation of what their anatomy looked like because it matches across all of these remains. It's not a mix of human bones and ape bones, quote unquote, although that would be like saying it's a mix of dog and canine bones. Um, and we know that Australopithecus afarensis was bipedal because she has all the hallmarks of bipedality that we humans have today that biomechanically make it impossible for us to have been knuckle-walking quadrupeds without getting arthritis in every bone in our body. So for instance, Lucy, like us, had a bowl-shaped pelvis with sagally oriented iliac blades to, to anchor powerful gluteal muscles on the side. She had special structures on the ischium that allow for muscle attachment sites is, is really what we're looking at there. They have a, a valgus knee, which helps hold the, the weight in one column underneath the body. They have an anterior frame and magnum. That hole at the base of the skull is shunted way to the front so that the skull can sit directly on top of the vertebral column and sort of a single, single column survey the landscape around you. And of course, their feet look like ours. They had an inline big toe. Their feet didn't look like hands, like what we see in chimpanzees. And they had three arches in their feet. And we know this not just because we have the feet, but because we also have the footprints that they left in the form of uh, trackways, like the Laetoli footprints. And you know, creationists look at the Laetoli footprints and they say, well, those are just human prints. Well. Paleoanthropologists, being ever clever as they are, decided to, to test that hypothesis um, because they were trying to figure out how early Homo appears. And so they took casts of the Laetoli footprints. They took casts of a trackway that they had modern, modern human hunter-gatherers create in sort of a mock ashway. And then they did the same thing with chimpanzees that they had walk in that ashway. And the Laetoli footprints are intermediate. So these belong to a bipedal hominin that is walking in its own unique way, not quite like humans, not quite like a bipedal chimpanzee, but certainly something that was walking on two feet like us. And certainly there were more than one of them. So that's your long-winded answer. <laughs> that was literally as short as I could get it. <laughs> Creationists like to, to say things like evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics, and they throw out all of this stuff about entropy. And the reason I think this is a silly argument, and the reason why it's kind of embarrassing, is because physics is not in my field, and I can speak to how goofy this is. Entropy, right, applies to closed systems. In closed systems, entropy must increase. The Earth is not a closed system. We're interacting with the sun. In fact, ultimately, the majority of the energy on the planet comes from the sun. It reaches photosynthetic organisms, and those photosynthetic organisms are consumed by other critters along the trophic level, and then they incorporate that energy. So no, evolution does not violate the laws of entropy because the system on the planet is not closed. Yeah, this, this one is strictly silly. And where, the place where it comes from, this idea that there's no beneficial mutations, it comes from an idea that, that creationists have about fitness. So fitness is kind of how traits are decided, as it were, filtered through in populations. It's how evolution happens. So what this means is that when you have a mutation in a population, if it increases the fitness, that is to say, if it gives the organism a reproductive advantage of some kind, then what that means is that it's probably going to proliferate because that organism that had it, as compared to other organisms in its group, is going to reproduce more often, it's going to live longer, so the reproduction is going to occur over more years or months or however long the organism lives typically than 
as compared to its sort of compatriots. And as a result, there's going to be a greater chance, statistically speaking, of that mutation being passed on. So creationists think that fitness is like what is literally the biggest, fastest, strongest, smartest in, in a given population. But that simply isn't true. Mutation, and thus the beneficial um, nature of that mutation, or not so beneficial nature, is entirely context specific. So as a result, whether or not a mutation is going to be beneficial or not is going to depend on the context in which that mutation occurred. So for example, creationists like to talk about uh, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. And they say, haha, well that might be beneficial to the bacteria that's resistant to the antibiotics in the condition where antibiotics are present. But that bacteria actually gets, uh, it, it's at a disadvantage compared to the ancestral population if you put it back into that initial context before the population adapted to the presence of antibiotics. Yeah, duh, that's how evolution works, right? In the context that it evolved to be in, it is kind of fine-tuned, if you, if you will, if I may use that language, to that situation, not the previous one. Consider a forest that's in a temperate zone, in an area where the climate is changing to be colder, and you have a group of wolves. And in this group of wolves, there is a mutation that causes them to have thicker fur, slightly thicker fur. And over the generations, this moves and kind of moves to fixation within the population, and all of the wolves are now better protected against the cold, which is getting worse because the local climate is changing. We'll give it 100,000 years and then take these now very fluffy, very adorable wolves and plop them back into that warmer, temperate environment that they lived in prior to, to the changing of the climate, and they're going to overheat easier. They're going to be less fit in that environment as compared to the environment that they have now, their, that their population has now been adapted to. So mutation is entirely context specific. And this even goes for things like having big brains, which seems like something that would be universally beneficial. Why doesn't everything involve it? Because they're expensive. You have to be able to exploit a lot of different resources in order to actually fuel a big brain. Same thing with big muscles. This is why everything isn't like a hulking, you know, a, a bodybuilder looking animal, because it's not always advantageous. Creationists like to imagine that mitochondrial Eve is a person that lived and was like the only woman who was capable of reproducing at her time. Mitochondrial Eve is a woman who was a part of a population, not just like Adam and Eve, like literally the only two people on the earth after some large chaotic bottleneck. So instead what we're looking at here is one individual living in a population whom everybody can coalesce their ancestry back to. Coalescence is like the, it's how evolution works. If, if you have a population of things that divide, even if you're starting with two individuals or a population of individuals, eventually as you move back through time, there is going to be an individual who everybody can sort of trace back as the last universal common ancestor within that group. That's, that's, liter that's mathematics. You, you can't work it any other way. Now, the, the researchers who discovered, quote unquote, mitochondrial Eve, who lived approximately 300,000 years ago, it was sort of a, a tongue in cheek <laughs> statement, ah, mitochondrial Eve, the mother of us all. But naturally creationists have co-opted this into meaning that the scientists have discovered that Eve was one person living with just one man 6,000 years ago. And like, it, it gets a little dicey too, because the, the mathematics that we use to, to coalesce back to that, last universal common ancestor of, of, the, of the mitochondria of humans did not live 6,000 years ago. And we know that because we got to that, to, to who that individual was by taking mutations backward in time. Common design is commonly used as this argument against common descent. And, and it came about through intelligent design proponents because they basically were sick and tired of hearing from everybody the truth of the matter, which is that all organisms fall into nested hierarchies. So Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy way back in the day, he classified organisms by how similar they were to one another. And this means that as you move up or down in taxonomic rank, you either get more specific or less specific, hence a nested hierarchy. Hierarchy, right? A dog is more closely related to a wolf than it is to any other animal, and dogs and wolves are both mo more closely related to foxes than they are to like bears. But dogs, wolf, foxes, and bears are all more closely related to one another than any of them is to a cat, and so on and so forth until you have the last universal common ancestor. So nested hierarchies were were tough for creationists because not only did they exist morphologically as Linnaeus classified them, but the modern synthesis rolls around, we get genetics and the, the hierarchies are recapitulated in the genome, which is difficult
difficult because genetics are inherited, right? So the same sort of logic that you could use to link me, my mom, my grandma, and my great grandma was being utilized at the species scale, at the genome level to link organisms together. It's the exact same logic. And I know creationists accept paternity tests and they accept that dogs are related to wolves. So their answer to this was, ah, you know what it is? It's actually just common design. Yes, these things look very similar, and yes, their genetics recapitulate this, but the reason is because the genetics are coding for a phenotype, and physical similarities are, are what we see all the time in human design, right? Cars look the same, but it's not because the cars are descending from one another, it's because of a common designer. And of course, there's many flaws with that. The first being cars don't reproduce, so they're not actually passing a genetic through line down that can be reliably tracked through time to link organisms as being related, as again, they would accept with me, my mom, and my grandmother through a, a paternity test or a maternity test. But the problem with this is non-functional DNA. Because nested hierarchies do exist in DNA, and maybe you could potentially explain that away as common design. Because what they're saying is, these organisms have similar functions, so God designed them with similar blueprints to meet the needs of those functions. Problem is, the majority of the DNA for all of us as organisms doesn't do anything. A lot of it doesn't do anything at all. It is non-functional DNA. So that DNA creates a hypothesis, right? If there's a nested hierarchy as a result of design, then the non-functional DNA should not fall into a nested hierarchy because it's not falling into God's plan of design. It's not doing anything. So if it does fall into a nested hierarchy, God's just being tricky because he's making it look like evolution both in form and function and also in the, the stuff that doesn't do anything at all. And unfortunately for creationists and intelligent design proponents, not only is there a nested hierarchy in non-functional DNA, but it is the same hierarchy that we see in functional DNA and the same hierarchy that we see in morphology. So it's three different lines of evidence all converging on the same general pattern of nested hierarchies for organisms. And this same pattern shows morphologically that humans are most closely related to chimpanzees and other apes, genetically that humans are most closely related to chimpanzees and other apes, and in the non-functional genes of, of our genomes that humans are most closely related to chimpanzees and other apes. And um, there's nothing really that they can do about it. I've not seen a response from them on why is it that there's this nested hierarchy both in the design portions of the genome and the do-nothing parts of the genome. Maybe God's just deceptive in their view. I'm not quite sure, but I've not seen uh, any answer, let alone a compelling one. It's all empty calories. And, and if I could say one more that, that I think, I love to talk about this one, it's my, my OKO to young earth creationism, at least without miracles, which given we have the creation museum, which is attempting, and you know, of course the ID proponents, which are all attempting to get creationism taught alongside science, this is the problem. If you want to be a creationist with, with no evidence and not teach it in school, sure, like I do, do what you want. In fact, I have no problem with it. I think you should have the freedom to do that. And I know most people would, would agree with me there. The problem is they want it taught in schools and they want it taught alongside specifically science, right? Scientific topics that have empirical evidence to support it. And at present, young earth creationism is physically impossible. Like straight up within the realm of physics, it is physically impossible. Because what they have to do is they have to explain why we get radiometric dates for all of the rocks in our geologic column that are very much older than 6,000 years, going back to 3.8 billion years over at the Canadian Shield and 4.5 billion years when we're looking at meteorites and things of that nature. So the solution that creationists came up for for this is they simply said, well, during Noah's flood or during creation, uh, God just sped radioactive decay up to make it look like those dates are very old, just to make it look like it. Um, and maybe not intentionally, maybe it was just, they, usually they say, well, maybe the process was just so, you know, Noah's Ark is already so catastrophic, it just happened. Uh, and my answer to that is the amount of energy that is released when you, when you radiometrically decay something for a few, few minutes even, uh, means that you're, you're releasing heat. There's thermal energy involved in that. And so if you want to take 4.5 billion years worth of time and cram it into the year of Noah's flood, this is equivalent to every cubic meter of the planet, every cubic meter of the planet getting like several hydrogen bomb detonations like, of energy. That's too much heat. 
It's, it's simply too much heat. That would vaporize the granitic crust of the Earth during the events of Noah's Ark. And you'll have, for, you'll have to forgive me, I used to have the exact number in, in joules off the top of my head. You can find it on a video on my channel where I, I actually show the math of, of where all this heat is coming from and how it translates to Hiroshima events per square meter and per square kilometer on the planet. It is completely untenable. And then they have to say, okay, well, maybe God spirits away the heat. Maybe he gets rid of the heat and the heat is not a problem. Well, that's really curious to me then. Why does the radiometric dates that we get for these rocks that were supernaturally sped up during the event of Noah's flood, why do those dates match what we get from tree ring dating and ice core dating and thermoluminescence and varv counting? And even the rate at which the continents are separating from one another matches radiometric dating at different points along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So not only are we speeding up radioactive decay, I guess, during the flood and miracling away all this heat, but we're also making it look as though it is, is speeding up in stepwise with all of these completely unrelated independent processes. For what? To trick everybody? It doesn't make any sense. So because of this, young earth creationism is, is untenable as a science idea and thus cannot be taught alongside science. And as I said earlier, so is intelligent design. Neither of these can stand alongside sort of conventional science. And, and to be clear, because I've, I am amicable towards people who are science accepting religious people, just you, you got to leave, you got to leave the, the sort of religious position at the door when you come in and do your science. And other than that, go nuts. I've got no problem with it.